Welcome to Living Outside the Matrix, the show where we explode modern myths and question the fundamental assumptions of the mainstream narrative. Hi there, I'm your host, Nigel Howitt, and on the show today, it's my great pleasure to be joined by Jeffrey A. Tucker. The purpose of the show today is to explore Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies in general and their implications for societal change and particularly our freedom. So uh, Jeffrey has a, an economics and journalism degree. He's a, a prolific writer and commentator. He's written uh, about nine books, I believe, uh, the most recent of which, um, Right Wing Capitalism, The Other Threat to Freedom. Perhaps we'll talk about that later on. And also Bit by Bit, um, How Peer to Peer is Freeing the World, along with other books. He's written uh, hundreds of articles and uh, he also started Liberty Me, I believe, and has a controlling interest still in a an interesting new investment firm called Vellum Capital, um, based around the cryptocurrencies. Perhaps we'll also hear about that. Jeffrey, a very warm welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I should also mention that my main gig, just because my, my bosses would appreciate it, is at the American Institute for Economic Research. It was founded in 1933. So, uh, you know, as in opposition to devaluation and bank closings and gold confiscations. So in many ways, it's kind of a natural home for me to write about crypto. Brilliant. Yes, thank you for adding that um, and uh, filling in for me missing out there. Perhaps we could kick off, um, Jeffrey, with, with you um, you know, expanding a little bit about how you got into what you're doing. You're, you know, you're obviously an authority on uh, on econo economics and Bitcoin. Um, and uh, perhaps you could just uh, give us a bit of an introduction. Anyway, tell us a bit about yourself. Sure, sure, sure. So I've, I fell in love with economics uh, when I first entered uh, college and I was uh, very anxious for economics to become more real than it was in the classroom. You know, so often when you're studying economics, it's it's all about mathematics and hydraulics and strange uh, insistence on unusual cause and effect relationships that are never quite uh, explained, or just kind of presumed. And so I, I bumped into economic history uh, of the Weimar period, really in Germany, and saw how bad money drove society into the ground and, and created the conditions of, for the rise of dictatorship. And that was really interesting to me because then I realized, oh, well, there is a relationship between economics and, and human life. <laughs> and, and, and the quality of, of the money itself is very often decisive. So having you've gotten curious about that I, I really have just i've just never let it go i i wrote my undergraduate thesis on 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 gold and i've been reading about the subject ever since and and very much interested in seeing a reform of the money because once once you realize the relationship between the quality of money and the quality of life it, it, it takes you in unusual directions like i, I saw the relationship between uh, the rise of central banking and 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 total war like uh, world war one and world war two and skirmishes all over the world between between fiat money and inflations and and depressions of business cycles uh debt accumulation all these things which which also affects you know the culture and and how we think about our own lives and how we our consumption habits and it's just this pervasive thing so when when crypto came along i was i was curious about how crypto was related to what i already knew and it took me a couple of years to kind of like fully wrap my brain around it and that was all the way in uh, 2011 12 and 13 and by early 2013 i was i was i was completely convinced actually uh, and just started writing about it, and it's been one of the great pleasures of my life to see the rise of the sector, to see its its continuing evolution, distribution, and then most recently how how the, this innovation is challenging central banking at its very core. I totally share your enthusiasm for the cryptocurrencies. Um, I, I probably, like many others, wished I'd got on board um, quite a lot earlier. <laughs> but uh, there you go. Well, the thing you have to remember about the crypto sector, and I, I know I know so many people who just, as soon as the subject comes up, they're like, "Oh, I wished I'd done this. I wished I'd done that." But you know, you have to remember that that this is this is true for for absolutely everybody in sure. the space. So there's no person who did it right. I have friends of mine who got involved with uh, Bitcoin when it was uh, 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 just a few pennies. 
and they held on to it until it became uh, one dollar. And you think about it in those days, right? It's like, wait a minute. So this magic internet money is is just as valuable as the world's most valuable stable currency. I mean, how's that believable? And so then when it went to two dollars, they figured, okay, this is a bubble. And I'm going to sell everything. <laughs> I doubled. I, I well over doubled my money, so I'm out. Yeah. So. Things like that happen. Sure, sure. Um, well, Jeffrey, perhaps we could kick off by sort of defining money, really, because it has been said that a lot of people don't understand Bitcoin and don't appreciate its significance um, because they fundamentally don't get money. Um, can, can you shed some light or give us a definition of money? I, I've heard that perhaps you're, you're less hung up on the definition of money than perhaps some other people. Could you share with us your views on a definition of money? I, th I think the easiest way to define money is just just to identify it as a thing that you acquire not to consume, but rather with the intention of trading for something else that you actually want later on. Uh, so money is what you use for indirect exchange as versus something else that you want to use for direct exchange. It's pretty simple. Um, so that um, uh, if I wanted your wood burning stove over there and I wanted to trade you uh, the, you know, a bunch of mugs for it, you might, you might go for it. But if you don't want mugs, then I've got to, I've got to find somebody else. Or maybe you'll take my mugs if you can anticipate that you can trade my mugs for something else later. You don't want my mugs, but you, you, you see a general demand for them. Uh, then in that case, this mug would, would serve a, m a money function. It's very simple, yeah. and so, really. And in that sense, money is very much tied to circumstances of time and place. Um, it's not the case that everyone else has to believe what you believe to be money to be money in order for something to become money. I mean, you and I can alone decide, or with a third party, uh, can monetize something. Um, and this actually happens all the time in real life, particularly in jails, where uh, money doesn't really, uh, a conventional uh, fiat money doesn't exist, something will be monetized. And, and there's so many things, of course, it could be cigarettes, but uh, it's also be cans of mackerel, it can be ramen noodles, it can be even services, uh, you know, of, of one sort or another can become money. So, so I think that's that's really it's it's a very simple definition, but I think it's I think it's the one that makes the most sense. Now, uh, over time, money came to be associated with the thing that everybody wants more than anything else. Like everybody, everybody in the whole country, maybe everybody in the whole world, uh, and that's very interesting. That's an indication that a particular monetary unit has had a great deal of uh, marketability, a great deal of success in persuading people of its money-ness. But I, don't, I wouldn't say that it, that is necessary to define what constitutes money. So what is used as money could change quite, uh, quite relatively quickly, I suppose, um, on your definition. I've heard, I've heard really uh, yeah, I've heard, I mean, obviously things like uh, Bitcoin, obviously the subject of this chat, has all these other um, characteristics that people uh, say money should have, like fungibility, divisibility, um, portability, obviously the ultimate portability over the, uh, over the web and so forth. So um, perhaps then you could uh, give the listeners and viewers, people that perhaps haven't quite got their head around Bitcoin, a, a brief um, synopsis of, of, of what Bitcoin in, in specifically, I suppose we're talking about Bitcoin, but generally we're really talking about the whole technology. But sure. Perhaps you could give us a, a little run in on what, what well, it is. I, I, every time I talk about this, it's, it slightly changes because actually my, my, my uh, knowledge and awareness uh, evolves. But what I've most recently realized is that you, know, you mentioned fundability, fundability, divisibility, all these features, uniform quality, uh, high value per unit of weight, all these things that people are associated with, with money. Uh, they really comes down to two functions people have traditionally attached to money. One is as a means of exchange, and the other is as a store of value. A means of exchange is just the thing you use to facilitate the trades you want to make through indirect exchange. Uh, a store of value is interesting. That's, uh, uh, you know, as you accumulate wealth, you need something to put it into besides uh, just physical property. You need the, the most liquid way of owning and collecting that wealth. And so money serves that function too. What cryptocurrency did is it added a third feature to the way money is used. 
by wrapping a payment network into the money itself instead of our traditional systems of dividing payment networks from money, it actually embedded the payment network as part of the money. What it did was it added a third feature of money's functionality, namely as a settlement layer for tr transactions. Okay. And, 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 and that, is, that is very interesting because if, you, if you, your money itself is, is embedded within a payment system, what, what you've done is ra radically reduced uh, counterparty risk. And counterparty risk is something that we've always accepted as part of any kind of exchange that's not uh, related to, uh, it's not uh, geographically uh, connected to the proximity that we are with person. Like, like um, I can take a dollar if you're right next to me and give it to you in exchange for which you give me a cup of coffee. Um, and that, that, that transaction is now settled. It's done. Yeah. We, we've, we've, we've reassigned titles. You can look at the audit trail. What used to belong to you, it belonged to you, now it belongs to me, and vice versa. But and that's fine. But if we're not right next to each other and not using cash, then we've got a we've got a problem. We have to develop a, some kind of trust relationship, and we're going to have to use some kind of service to enable that transaction to take place. Sure. And that's where we get that's where we get you know credit cards and banks and all these financial intermediaries. And they are serving the, the function of, of providing settlement services, essentially. Yep. So like, like today, if I, if I send you a PayPal, um, it's probably going to be two, three, four, or five days before the thing is finally, ser uh, finally settled. And that's going to require a number of institutional uh, uh, interventions, you know, like a, uh, the PayPal itself. And they're using a credit rating agencies. And they're using banks and so on and so on. Um, Bitcoin came along as, as sort of just like wiped all that out and, and, and it did it by inventing a new ledger system uh, in, the, in the cloud and it's a distributed ledger that everybody can look at and, uh, and this ledger reveals ownership claims. The audit trail is, is already part of the system itself and in, fa in fact the settlement layer that's that's in Bitcoin is so important that without it, Bitcoin would have no value whatsoever. It is the source of Bitcoin's value. Okay. It's it's a it's a beautiful service that uh, and, and and that everybody needs the ability to track ownership rights and in, in trade essentially, and to delineate what those rights look like and and not and and make fraud impossible so that you and I can't be the claimants of the same exact thing. Okay. No, uh, that no was double spending or anything like that. No, no, no double spending and no infinite creation of, of digital things. Like, you know, the digital world makes infinite uh, reproducibility just kind of very, very easy. Yeah. Uh, the blockchain made it uh, uh, completely impossible. So that Brilliant. was the real technical innovation. Uh, it, in other words, it hacked the digital world to get it to behave like the physical world. Hmm. Uh, just by the by a protocol that uh, that strictly uh, assigns ownership claims to particular units or whatever those units may be and and it was it was only once the system uh, started working and people started to believe in it that Bitcoin itself captured the value of that service and that took uh, essentially ten months from the time of the initial release of the what's called the 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 genesis block of the first block of, of claims that was uh, put on the ledger. And between uh, the first week of January 2009 and uh, in October, uh, there was no record that Bitcoin had any value at, at all. Like it was zero because the system was still being tested and tried. Mm -hmm. And then uh, by early October, it became obvious that it was working, that this was a really inno uh, innovative system. And therefore, uh, the Bitcoin, Bitcoin, which represents an ownership claim of some sort on the ledger, uh, came to be valuable. Amazing, huh? It is amazing. And, and the other you know, amazing, exciting thing about uh the, the cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, is is that uh, it, it totally seems to smash away this this need for for, for central banking. I mean, it's got so, I see such potential, um, as I'm sure you can elucidate more on, uh, with, with the potential to 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 really change the landscape. And yeah. I, I think I've heard you say somewhere before that um, 
Bank, um, banking and money has sort of been commandeered by governments, you know. I mean, obviously, since uh, 1913 over there in the States, um, for a bit longer over here in the UK. But, uh, I mean, that that's fundamentally blown away now, isn't it? That, that's right. So there's two things that are really important to central banking, and, and we've always taken them for granted. We always thought that they were true. One is that, that all the legal tender that's floating around in a particular country or region um, is the, sourced from the state. You know, so all the money comes from the state. That wasn't true even 100 years earlier. It was very common in the UK and the US for, for, country, for, for private coinage to exist all over the place and for other countries' coinage to float around uh, in, in, our, in our own countries. In the early 19th century in the US, you had coins from all over the world that were, that were being distributed and, and not always from governments. I mean, sometimes they were private coins. The early part of the Industrial Revolution in the UK, for example, um, private coinage was, was a big deal because government was only good at making large denomination things for, for the ruling class. And, and as capitalism began to rise, uh, get, rise up and, and the distribution, uh, the uh, division of labor became more and more complex, people were doing small amount of jobs and uh, the, the workers were moving from the countryside in and they weren't paid that much money to work in the factories. And the government didn't mint any coins that could be paid in small denominations. Really? So there was this, a big industry that came that 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 grew up in in uh, in England, in particular, uh, and Scotland, uh, in which button makers began to retool their factories to make small denomination coins, just so that the workers could be paid. Okay, you know, yeah, and so, and so so that that kind of that kind of freedom associated with coinage and monetary. Uh, the, the the industry of money itself was was kind of taken for granted in in the 18th and early 19th century, but as the 19th century went on, money came to be more and more, I guess you could say, centralized. Like like the government started getting a really intense interest in money. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they why. always do. Yeah, I wonder why. And uh, by the late 19th century and early 20th century, then money's production, the production of money itself, came to be completely monopolized by the state. Now, central banking was, was uh, the next step because central banking is different from like a national bank, like the Bank of England or something that used to be just a national bank. Or in the U.S., we had uh, the National Bank of the United States. You know, these were banks specifically established to serve government and vice versa. Like government would provide special protections for this institution. This institution would would be the primary bondholders of debt floated by the state. Central banking took that to the next step and said all the banks in the country will operate under a single clearing system guaranteed by government. And all the banks in the country will, in effect, serve, you know, as, as a kind of a quid pro quo, as serve as a network for holding and servicing the debt of the state. So that was central banking. Then they added other things to central banking, like, oh, and this will be a good system because we'll eliminate inflation, banking crises, we'll get rid of uncertainty, liquidity crises, there won't be any of these weird banks that, that come and go, we'll guarantee that everybody will get their money when they want it. And also we have this new thing called monetary policy. We'll manipulate the supply of the money in order to keep society on a permanent uh, uh, track uh, to uh, endless uh, peace and prosperity for everybody. That was, that was the claim anyway. That's it's pretty true. interesting that right after uh, central banking was, was created and now you had, so you had all the banks of the country operating under a single government system and all the money floating around in the country that was entirely monopolized by the state, the very first thing that governments did with all their l lovely new powers was create a world war. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Great. So, so yeah, go on. Uh, oh, anyway, my my the point of going through this history is to say that 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 in our lifetimes and lifetimes of anybody we know or have ever met, um, central banking and fiat uh, fiat government monopolies have been have been the norm. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, so, so, so the advent of crypto is, is actually a, a very radical step. I, it's not necessary in any way that everybody start using Bitcoin instead of dollars. Or everybody trades ethers instead of yen or something like that. What, all that matters is that we shatter the monopoly. 
Okay. Uh, because because the, the existing system is is premised on these on these two monopolies, like all the money has to flow through the banking system and all the money has to be minted by the state. Uh, it all has to be legal tender and flow through, uh, through through the, the government's banking system. Okay. And once and once once something else becomes possible, like a brand new form of money that doesn't flow through uh, the the banking system. Uh, then you've got really a, essentially a leak, and 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 it's a leak that could eventually uh, smash uh, central banking as we know it. Sure. So I mean, obviously, you're you're starting to hint at some of uh, some of the uh, the potential for uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, to to really change things. Do you, do you think that uh, you know a lot of people say that um, I've heard a lot of people say that it'll be regulated they won't allow it and yet you hear the counter argument it can't be regulated so where, where do you think the future lies with that can can this genie be put back in the bottle you know can, can the horses be <laughs> brought back into the stable after they've bolted well uh, when when you're speaking about the the, the crypto ecosystem itself the imp- it's very important to remember that we're just talking about mathematics. Okay. That's all. It's just math and it's distributed to everybody. And it's no more possible to get rid of crypto or regulate crypto than it is possible to regulate algebra. Okay, yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you can, you, a government can declare algebra illegal, but it's not exactly going to take it away from, sure. from people's minds. I mean, it's absurd. I suppose, but, I suppose uh, really what we mean is, is the interface between, for example, the national currency and the crypto world. So, so your exchanges, that's right. I mean, that's, that's the point of interference. And, and, and that, becomes, that becomes very critical as the onboarding and the offboarding. From from shifting from one from the fiat ecosystem to the crypto ecosystem, right. and back again becomes you know highly subject to regulation, and that that's been going on now for a very long time. I mean, it really began essentially at least in the United States in 2013. I mean, we we had it's it's actually just a tremendous tragedy what what government has done to crypto. Actually, and more and more reflecting on it. Um, uh, if we had a, a growing competitive system, even in 2011, 2012, with with exchanges, so that if you had a complete laissez-faire system, and anybody could take dollars or uh, or, or pounds or, or or whatever or euros and and exchange them for crypto and back again with absolutely no restrictions. There, you know, there would be an exchange on every block. I mean, the exchanges would be we'd be much more advanced than sure. we are today. But governments immediately started uh, calling those things because they were competing with, with prevailing financial services. They said, uh, uh, nah, we have to regulate these things. You're now a money exchange. And if you're going to be a money exchange, you have to you know, jump through these uh, uh, 150,000 uh, pages of regulations and it's going to cost you a ton of money and you're going to have to be, be really good friends with the regulators and the bankers are really going to have to like you and and so on and so on. No free market. So, so, right, no free market. And so that was a catastrophe really. And and the very first effect of that was to create a monopoly in crypto exchanges. You know, the, the means by which you would go from dollars to crypto and back again and the first big monopoly that was created was was the one in Japan, Mt. Gox. I mean, Mt. Gox would have never had the 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 power. Uh, yeah, I think it was regulating like ninety or to ninety five percent of the exchanges in the early days. The only reason that happened was because everybody was scared. The regulators were interested. The regulators were threatening everybody, and so this one little. Uh, really amateurish outfit and and Japan became the the only way to to buy Bitcoin can you imagine there's other ways you could have done it on the streets or whatever but if you're going to use your bank use money in your bank to try to buy Bitcoin the only way you could do it in those days uh, plausibly viably was through Mt. Cox and that gave them an unwarranted monopoly power it was a kind of an amateurish operation and sure enough uh, they had security problems or lots of leaks. They lied about what was going on, and we saw our first big Bitcoin crisis. That was entirely caused by government regulations. And and I remember in early 2013, after after the Mt. Gox thing, 
Let's see. Let me think. Was that? No. Mt. Gox came late in 2013. But in early 2013, many people were anticipating what was going to happen to Mt. Gox and started trying to build more exchanges. And there were many. I had many friends of mine who were building exchanges all the time. And everybody was really in, in the industry and everything. And sometime, I think it was like in April or May of 2013, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, which was uh, a FinCEN operating out of the U.S. Treasury Department, uh, uh, sent out like a one-page PDF and said, if you're accepting dollars for crypto or converting crypto back to dollars, you have to register as an exchange. And okay. immediately, uh, people just left the industry. It was terrible. So the only people that were standing, I mean, there were like seven companies that, that had already developed some semblance of an exchange and had enough capital to hop through all the regulatory requirements. And it was a disaster. I mean, the, 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 the industry right now is not competitive for that very reason. We don't have as many exchanges as we would. Uh, yeah, and so and the regulations have caused you know no end of damage. I mean, it, we're, oh, the other thing is that instead of working out, you ever wonder why why crypto user interfaces are so scary? Like, I, I would never try to get my mo my mother in this industry because it's actually it's, so it's hard actually to use. Too yeah, yeah, it's so hard to use. The reason it's so hard to use is that all the development resources have had to go into compliance rather than innovation on the consumer side. Right. It was so tragic. Yeah. So, I mean, regulation doesn't work, does it? I mean, we know that from you know lessons in in all areas of economics, but but to those people that would perhaps stay out of uh, of any involvement with a, a cryptocurrency because they suspect that one day they might all lose it, it'll be confiscated, or somehow government will catch up with them. What do you say to to those people, Jeffrey? Do you, do you think that cannot happen? Well, I, th I think that right now it cannot happen. And, and there's a number of reasons why this. One is that it, it's, it's so censorship resistant and it lives on a distributed network. There's nothing governments can do to stop it. Uh, at least they can't control the ecosystem itself. Correct. The other thing that's really interesting is that it's such a better system than what we have right now. And nobody knows that more than the banking industry, more right. than treasury officials. I mean, government agencies are profoundly aware that what we have here is a Maserati compared to the Model T. I mean, it's, it really, and, and they know it's the future. Yeah. Uh, they, well, they that was going to be a uh, next um, point, really, is was uh, maybe you can summarize what you think is is wrong with the system, because uh, I totally get what you're saying there. Can you can you just yeah. expand on on well, perhaps what are the factors, nail them down, that, that are wrong with the current system? There's the, the counterparty risk is 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 pervasive. You know, you can't and, and, and it's and it's bad for everybody. There's high costs and trust. Uh, the other thing is that the markets have kind of. You know, they're limited because they require people of a certain financial means, a certain reputation. Um, uh, people have to have access to banks. They have to trust the banks. There's all these things. So as a result, two-thirds of the world's population is unbanked. Yeah. You know, and you can't, I live in Atlanta. I, I live in Atlanta, which is a very interesting city. We have uh, the, the, the wealthiest uh, per capita unbanked population of any city in the world i mean it's actually amazing i mean atlanta's got a, a very interesting complex uh, demographic and and many 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 people who are extremely successful entrepreneurial and enterprising in the city <clears throat> simply do not trust the banking system because they're they're afraid the bankers are gonna are gonna look at this maybe their source of income as being a little bit sketchy you know, uh, that they feel like they're subjecting their the, the violations of privacy, that they don't trust the banks. They think the banks are working with government. The government's going to just freeze them out at some point. There's a whole variety of reasons why people don't trust. So they have they don't go to the banks. So they, they're dealing mostly in cash and in trust relationships. Okay. And, and, and those get really, really complex out here in Atlanta. I mean, I can tell you amazing uh, stories, actually, which actually I'm nervous to, so I won't. <laughs> but uh, uh, but um, the point is that when when crypto came along, Atlanta became wildly excited. Like anybody, and then could go to an ATM and use cash, feed into the machine, and and get crypto out. And that was huge. And and so as a result, uh, crypto is is massively popular 
in in the marginalized I should say financially marginalized, not socially marginalized, but financially marginalized co- communities. Okay, I mean, it definitely we've seen from from the uh, recent rise in in the value of Bitcoin and the, the recent bubble at the end of last year that um, that in order for it to gain value, it, it doesn't need you know necessarily a certain percentage of the population um, or what have you to actually jump on board in order for it to have be that store of value. But uh, <clears throat> do you? Do you think that it needs a wider uptake of, uh, of of Bitcoin, either or the other cryptocurrencies, either as a means of exchange, in order to precipitate the the other uses for for the blockchain technology, such as you know replacing the legal system, the fact that contracts and things can can obviously be put on this public uh, distributed ledger. You know, well, a strange thing happened in 2007. And by the way, I think all those kind of extra uh, uh, functions of blockchain are probably better performed by things like Ethereum. You know, which sure. is which, which is which is you know has its own blockchain and its own scripting language that allows you to anybody to write applications on top of it and within it. Bitcoin was never uh, able to do that. Bitcoin right. has a certain le- legacy value and it probably always will serve as a kind of settlement layer. Some people think. It's the new, the new gold, and that very well may be true. I'm kind of done making predictions about this sector. But <laughs> one of the things that happened to Bitcoin in 2017 is it became a victim of its own successes. Yeah. So, um, so, so, so I've heard it say. Sorry to interrupt you there, Jeffrey. But um, yeah. Bitcoin, I've heard it say, it's just simply um, a, a coin. It's simply a, a form of uh, money in exchange, as opposed to all these other possibilities you just mentioned, Ethereum. And, and I guess that that uh, opens the box for all of these other cryptocurrencies, all these other um, uh, technologies, if if you will, to to challenge it. So, do you, do you think, uh, uh, just to repeat the question, that that, that the these other um, uses of the technology will uh, develop completely independently of, uh, of Bitcoin being a store of value or being a means oh, of exchange? I, I, I'm absolutely certain of it. In fact, if, if Bitcoin were abolished now, it wouldn't it would probably change that much. I mean, there's, there's so many other competitive uh, coins. You know, even if you look at the market cap, market capitalization uh, of the entire crypto asset sector and Bitcoin's share of it, it's dropped from 90% all the way down to 32% just in the last 18 months. So that that's incredible. And that now, just to be clear, that's not because Bitcoin is somehow falling in value. It's just that so many other people, other uh, assets are rising. There's a number of reasons for the rise of, of these other things. One is the discovery of new applications, you know, within the Ethereum network and so on. And... All these other coins are providing very highly specialized services of one sort or another, but all related to the to documenting ownership rights. I mean, how many ways can you use a technology that documents ownership rights as well as a blockchain? I mean, there's there's potentially an infinite number. But there was a peculiar thing that happened in 2017. Bitcoin became so popular and the networks became so crowded that there is a, a, a it was unable to scale. Yeah. Because in 2010. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, who's the you know the programmer who originally released uh, the the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, uh, anonymous. We don't know you know who he is or where he is now, uh, or whether it's a they. I mean, we really don't know. But in 2010, Satoshi implemented a a block size limit, so the new blocks are added to the chain. Uh, they could only have they could only be one megabyte and that could only hold a certain number of transactions with no extraneous information and the reason he did that is because in 2010 people were goofing around with the system sending you know things back and forth back and forth back and forth back and it was kind of a waste I and mean, he considered it kind of spam and it was like a it was like a, a method to to eliminate the spam and on the on the system uh, and that block size was never increased that wasn't a problem from 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, and even 16, a lot of people saw that as the network was getting bigger, it's it going to be, be a problem. problem yeah. But the consensus, the, the the consensus rules for making changes in the protocol, uh, finally, it couldn't quite get its act together in time. <laughs> and so, in 2017, we woke up to a different world. I mean, With the it fork. was funny because uh, well, the fork happened, but I mean, the different world I'm referring to in particular is that 
uh, uh, that in the old days, I used to go to pizza with guys. One guy would throw down his, his fiat credit card, and we would all uh, uh, divide the check with Bitcoin and sending Bitcoin back and forth to each other, you know, at virtually no cost and instant. And instantly moved and I thought that was the great advantage of Bitcoin. It's like look there's no fees and it's all instant and all these transactions are finally settled at virtually no cost. I mean, this is amazing. Suddenly in 2017 it became crazy like I, I began to notice it happening. I would send, I used to give crypto to, to friends all the time. I give Bitcoin to people all the time just because I thought it was a nice thing to do. I had to stop doing it because it became too expensive for me personally. I mean, I would try to send, uh, you know, send uh, send 20 bucks and they charged me seven. I'd be like, the miners. And it's, yeah. it, I'm not blaming the miners here. The miners are, the, are the, just just for your listeners. The miners are, are, are the people who confer, confirm uh, transactions. Uh, in exchange for which they get the the first release of uh, Bitcoin uh, that's that's generated on on, uh, on, a, on, a, on a schedule that's embedded within the protocol. So the miners would always accept uh, the highest bids for transactions, obviously, before they accept the lowest bids, and those those numbers kept getting higher and higher and higher. Yeah. And and so Bitcoin weirdly became a. a you know, kind of a victim of its own successes. Like no other token had this problem. So because transaction were, transaction costs just were getting out of control then? Totally out of control. You couldn't yeah. use it anymore. That's when the so-called hodling movement came along. It's like, well, you shouldn't be using it anyway. You should just be holding it. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, Bitcoin is meant to be used. Uh, and and suddenly it just became, you could use it, of course, but but you had to wait a very long time for transactions to settle. And it was strangely expensive. I mean, I woke up one day and I was like, oh no, uh, the main features that I loved about Bitcoin are no longer applicable. What does this mean? And I was very late to discovering this because by then you had 100 coins, 500 coins, you know, a thousand other competitors and the whole space just blew up. So, you know, that's what I mean by currency competition. You know, uh, it's it's no longer necessary for one thing like Bitcoin to be the thing. No. Everything else can 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 substitute. Sorry, my lights keep going on and off here. I hope that's not a problem for you. No problem at all. No. Okay. So um, yeah. So did, did we address the, uh, the 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 problem the problems with with money and the centralized money, the the central banking, the fiat currency, the yeah. the inflation of fiat currency. Obviously, Bitcoin addresses that with its twenty one million coins built into the, yes. the, the system. Are, are there any other problems within the system that uh, Bitcoin stroke cryptocurrencies uh, well, I address? Th I think the the, yeah, the fundamental and this is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, there are many aspects of the crypto world that fix what's wrong with government fiat currency. That's true, but the but the very the, the, the really the core of it is that when government monopolized the money and implemented central banking, it no longer became subject to any kind of technological improvement. Right. Now it, it's as if. You know, uh, everybody, all the world's ruling classes, to, you know, 100 years ago said, we know now how to make money. We know how the system should work. We're going to freeze it in place and never going to change. Uh, that doesn't work for any good. It doesn't work for, for shoes. It doesn't work certainly not for computers, for flight, for communication technology, There's, for medicine or food or anything else. We want a world in which things can improve. Sure, yeah. Suddenly, it, it just wasn't possible to improve. Now, we saw some improvement in payment systems over the course of the century, but those weren't due to central banks or the, or the money. That's just simply because other people came along and established really wonderful systems over trust, you know, Visa, MasterCard, and credit cards, and various credit systems, and everything else. And, and then when the internet came along, those became much more sophisticated. We got online banking, we got things like PayPal, and, and even now you can use Venmo and any number of services to transfer money. I don't know what, what's popular in the UK, but there's many number of payment systems. Those all uh, rest, though, on this kind of uh, uh, technology of money that really hadn't improved at all. So with Bitcoin now, suddenly we have an, a money that can improve. Sure. The, and it can progress, it can adapt, it can get better, and it can keep up with the times. It, it does seem to be one of those um, things that's really benefited from an explosion in innovation, doesn't it? Um, there seems to be just so many things happening so fast. Well, it's, the technological. It's, yeah, that's really true. I mean, it's like 
once you unleash that creativity and applied it to money, we're seeing amazing things happen. Like it's like it's like a hundred years of creativity is suddenly just like happening all at once, you know, and it's all happened in the last two or three years. I mean, it's amazing. What do you um, think about other technologies such as Hashgraph, for example, that's that's not open source? Do you, do you think that the open source uh, feature of, of the other cryptocurrencies um, is, is sacrosanct? I, I, I don't. I, I like it the most, right? It's the one, I, I like the open source nature of the distributed network. Uh, I like public blockchains. I like tokenized uh, 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 chains that that are sort of democratically accessible to everybody. I mean, this is just, that's my love. Sure. On the other hand, you can use blockchain technology in, in uh, sort of enterprise, single enterprises, um, that that are not public, that are not tokenized, and that are not publicly available, and they just they help keep track of ownership rights within a single firm or a single single network of firms. There's nothing wrong with that. To me, it's it's really it's it's a market. But these are really different sure. different things. I have many people who work in the industry, like uh, here in Atlanta. There are a number of large large scale consulting firms, and it's amazing to me how many corporations outsource now the development of these consulting firms it's just one of the weirdest things but they all have blockchain divisions now okay so every single large corporation and bank is going to the consultant saying build us a blockchain for uh keeping up with uh relations b2b relationships uh ownership claims within the firm and so on and they're all busy typing away making blockchains for uh, enterprise style blockchains Sure. I mean, one that springs to mind is is, is Ripple um, as as a, yeah. as one to be used. Um, or I see it, but you can correct me if I'm wrong. One that to be used by the existing system, if you like. So okay. so I intuitively shy away from from a technology that can simply prop up the old regime, as it were. And um, I mean, what what do you think about those kinds of technologies? Do you think they'll simply be get get left in the dust as as uh, the ones that you know better enable our our, our economic freedom and, and it, liberty? They may have, they might eventually be, but I don't know what eventually really means in this case because we do have to have a transition period. Mm. Uh, but you know, that's just that goes with it. I don't, I don't. I'm one of these fundamentalists. I don't think that Ripple should really be called a, a real uh, crypto. No. Actually, I mean, that's my own my own view. But but uh, but 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 hey, you know, it's a market. Yeah. We'll see what happens. What's fascinating to me is the, the, the what you see happening in Venezuela. Like just yesterday, uh, there's a they're they're open to presale for a new currency in Venezuela called the Petro. And so this is a, a remarkable story of what's happened. So, the, cool. so a socialist government comes to Venezuela and they're like, we're going to have socialism. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, uh, I don't know. It's not really working. So the, let's just inflate the currency. And this is what <laughs> eventually I always thought happens. So they, they created um, four and five digit levels of inflation, you know, that have, have been dominant in the country now for three or four years yeah. and basically destroyed the national currency. In fact, this has been so perverse that there's actually been a fork in the official currency, the Bolivar, a market-based fork. So right now, you can buy uh, you can buy three digital Bolivars for one physical Bolivar, and you can arbitrage between the two. And there are very large-scale businesses that are making money in Venezuela just arbitraging between. Uh, the two forks of the boulevard, one physical, one, one digital. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I mean, so it's things you can't anticipate. Well, so the government gets wise. Whoops, we destroyed the currency. So well, now what are they going to do? So now they're, they're creating a cryptocurrency uh, that's somehow backed. I think, the, I think this whole thing is a little bit nutty by the oil reserves of the country. And, and the purpose of this is, to, is, is probably not to give the workers and peasants of Venezuela a new way to transact because they're already using crypto. Like everybody in Venezuela uses smart cash. Right. It's, an, it's, an, <clears throat> it's the number one uh, crypto in Venezuela. And, and people are very, very, it's amazing how creative people and how quickly people can learn sure. when their economic uh, future is, is dependent upon it. So smart cash is just the way everybody transacts in Venezuela. But the government needs some way to get around economic sanctions. And so that means they they have to have the technology that moves uh, their official currency uh, to to trading partners that's outside the banking system. 
Okay. So the patch level is what they're doing. And it's pretty funny. They've learned by watching ICOs and the function of crypto uh, uh, asset markets all around the world. And they're, they're trying to do the same thing and floating their own new cryptocurrency. So the whole thing is hilarious and, and, and wonderful in a way. Brilliant. It's fantastic seeing uh, innovation sort of, uh, you know, like water flowing around the rocks and, and so forth. Uh, you know, you, yeah. you just can't, you can't stop it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I haven't, uh, I haven't kept up to date with exactly what is happening in, in Venezuela, but uh, that's an interesting story. It's interesting to see. Uh, it, it, there, so there's widespread um, uptake out there. And, and it, do, you, do you find that, you know, with, with the, you know, government sort of effectively being the enemy in these situations, is there a tendency for, for, for people to sort of remain Remain within the the crypto ecosphere, as it were, or, or or is there a you know? I mean, it sounds as though with that uh, what you mentioned earlier, there is still a, a high degree of exchange between the two, in the national uh, currency. The, 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 well, there is uh, things are much more advanced in Venezuela. I mean, like everybody is kind of bailed from the boulevard. Of course, you still have to pay right. your bills and things like that. In your official electric bills and taxes and that kind of stuff. Yep. In in the boulevard, so. So there is a, a lot of movement uh, 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 back and forth, but but there's far more movement between various cryptos, between Bitcoin and Smart Cash, Smart Cash and, and Monero, and so on. And people are very adept at using the entire crypto ecosystem and just moving between uh, between assets. It's actually quite remarkable. Brilliant. I mean, this leads me to my next question, which is, I wanted your thoughts on on you know the, the nation state as a whole i mean because the the whole crypto ecosphere is is obviously uh, has disregard for national boundaries um like the internet can you summarize your 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 thoughts on on the implications really for, i suppose for the nation state um it, yeah it's 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 a big one but uh, the, yeah. the nation no, state no it's it's really important to understand that the nation states rely fundamentally on two tools that it has or two tools that are also limitations one is that it has to operate within a certain geographic uh, region so there's restrictions yeah. on this jurisdiction uh, the second thing is that states are very good at um, controlling the physical world and physical property like your person and property, but once that property migrates uh, to the digital realm and it's made of mathematics mm -hmm. rather than things you can touch, yep. um, that becomes a real problem for, for states. Yep. So in those two respects, crypto really just fundamentally challenges uh, the hegemony of, of states over the world. Now, so, <clears throat> and that's a really foundational issue because you know, we're talking about crypto breaking the central bank monopoly. That's a way of sort of uh, reversing a 20th century style model of the state, which, which, and people always underestimate this, this, the 20th century state that knows no limits to its power anywhere in the world is due to the advent of central banking, which gave governments a blank check to do whatever they wanted. And that's why they began to have like wildly exaggerated uh, 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 practices over over his powers. So so they regulate marriages. They issue passports. You know they t tell you how big your toilets can be in 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 your apartment. Uh, they tell you all the terms of exchange over labor, what you can charge, what you can't charge. They control prices. They control everything. Yep. And that's only because of central banking. So the breaking of that monopoly potentially returns us to a 19th century style model of the state, which is maybe the state is big, maybe it's annoying. Uh, uh, Maybe it tries to start wars. It can, it can, it can uh, take some taxes and things like that, in and out of the border. But, uh, but it, it can't start global wars or, or run, you know, a, a debts of, of twenty trillion and so on. But, um, but, but, but you're right that since cryptocurrency operates on a completely different model than the nation state itself, <clears throat> we could be seeing something like a restoration of a laissez-faire society yeah uh, uh, you know yeah i mean uh, you know meaning that, that 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 we all have we all have human human rights we all make decisions over our own lives you can keep all the money you make you can make deals with anyone regardless of of borders you can travel anywhere um you know i mean that that kind of world is the world i dream of me too and it's very possible that cryptocurrency could could usher that world you know into being you know not right away and not without struggle but 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 this is really crucial i you know one of the things i love to do is is follow what central bankers and other elites in the ruling class say about crypto and a lot of people are warning 
wow, this is a big deal. Um, it's, it offers a fundamental challenge. We better get with the challenge. We better get with the program. We better take this very seriously. The head of the IMF said this recently in a big speech. Uh, guys, you better wake up. Uh, look, look at the kind of form of money and investment that your grandchildren like because that's going to be the future. Mm-hmm. But the thing is that they're, they're, they're talking about it, but none of them, nobody is laying out a plan for what to do about it. Right. I mean, those, those uh, criteria listed earlier, I mean, they, they would, they would uh, surely fuel an explosion in, in wealth creation as well, wouldn't they? With, with this freedom and better, you know, respect for rights and, and, and more That's right. easier exchange of goods and services. I mean, that, that really is uh, sort of like the blue touch paper and stand back, isn't it? It's, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, like right now, the, the crypto asset sector is capitalized at, 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 a, at a level of... It's a, approaching a half trillion dollars or $500 billion. Um, by the end of this year, what happens when it's a trillion dollars? What happens when it's two trillion and then three trillion? And at some point, there's so much reserves and, and value in the sector uh, that once it's unleashed on the world, everything's going to change. So that, and, so that sort of capital just sort of backed up, sitting somewhere, ready to right. whoosh out when the... It's, it's, that's right. It's, it's a little bit like, if you want to think of a historical precedent for this, look what happened with the Great Depression, uh, both in the UK and the US. Um, you know, the uh, governments t- t- tried to uh, control the banking system and devalue the currencies and that sort of thing. The actual result was that people just kind of gave up on the system and stuffed all their money in their mattresses and the, and the savings rate went through the roof. And what's called the velocity of money plummeted down because people just stopped using the stuff. Yeah. And the stuff began to grow more valuable over time, which is to say we were in a, a big deflationary period. So then, and then World War II happened. Which put put it you know led people to be, become ever more risk averse with their currency. So when they made money, they just they'd restrict their consumption habits and just save, 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 save. So we went through like like fifteen years of you know hyper savings throughout the the developed world. And so once World War II ended and things calmed down again, and it seemed safe to go outside, you know, um, we saw all this capital just unleashed on, on the world and it built essentially 20 years of, of massive prosperity. I mean, it was, it was a beautiful thing to see. So I'm looking at that historical precedent and wondering, you know, what happens after we get through this initial phase uh, of the, the crypto capitalization of the world? You know, what happens when it comes to be unleashed on the world? I mean, it's going to be amazing. And, you know, there's not just powerful economic implications here. There's really interesting sociological and cultural and demographic implications. I mean, I hang around with a lot of people that are, how should I say, very, very rich as a result of uh, their early investments in this space. Uh, are, like, very rich. And, 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 they know it. Uh, they're very private, obviously, because there's so many kidnappings and things that are going on right now, ransom takings and hostage takings. And, you know, this is getting more and more common. My so goodness. these people are. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I, I the other day I was I, yeah, I, I'm very reluctant to give you details. Let's just say <laughs> I was tra- I was traveling and I met a friend of mine who I know for a fact is a at least 100 millionaire in the crypto space. He's dressed like a bum. Uh, he looks absolutely dis- disheveled. He's nervous to to sleep in hotels, so he sleeps on on you know. So he had a flight the next morning. He came in through a a, a, a transfer through um, uh, a, a flight. He had a connection flight the next morning. He slept on the airport floor. Uh, he got on the plane and 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 flies coach, you know, with with be- beat up tennis shoes, a rat- ratty sweatshirt, and a and a and a bag that seemed to be held together by t- by tape. You know, and, and, and yet, yet he's a hundred millionaire. This is actually really common in this sector. I mean, it's really interesting to me because the people who are getting like mega wealthy right now in, in cryptocurrency are is not the ruling class. It's not the people who went to the finishing schools. Mm-hmm. You know, they didn't come from high end families. They don't know how to use a fork and knife properly. <laughs> it's a complete sort of inversion, isn't it, of of, yeah, of it the is. wealthy class? I mean, who could have it, predicted it? it? <laughs> these are these are the guys you made fun of in high school. They were not popular. They were they had they were pimply, <laughs> and you know they weren't on the football teams. You know they were on the chess club, and and uh, nobody was, they were really good with the Rubik's cubes. You know. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and, and they weren't very popular. And nobody signed their yearbooks and, and that sort of thing. But now these people are, the, are going to be the new... Uh, the new um, Moves uh, and shakers? Yeah, are they, they going to... Economic elites okay. in the future. It's very much like, if you can look back in time, at the, at, the, at, the, um, at, the, at the end of the 19th century, we had this thing that's in the United States called the Gilded Age. Around the world, it's just called the Belle Epoque. I mean, it was... Or, yeah. I mean, it, it was... It was it was a time when new technologies were transforming the world. They were steel, it was flight, um, it was new communications technologies. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that these new technologies in the late 19th century were not in, embraced by, by, the, by the old aristocracy. No. Uh, it, was, it, was, it, was the, it was the edgy, scrappy immigrant families, largely, Jews <clears throat> in the U.S. and and uh, uh, Scots and uh, you know the Irish and uh, these sort of things. These are people who have been taking odd jobs since they were eight and nine years old. Mm -hmm. So they had a real feel for commerce. They had uh, a, a willing to take unusual risks because they they didn't go to the right schools. They didn't come from the right families, and and their parents weren't even around. So, so they were the people that were investing in, in these new technologies. They were the building, ones building the, the skyscrapers and, and pushing things like flight or indoor electricity or whatever, whatever. And, and, and the old aristocracy that, that was still a sort of legacy content from the early 19th century was extremely resentful of this new group of, of wealthy. They were, they were, and so they began to kind of impose on them regulations and income taxes and all, any kind of thing to control uh, the, this, this new, uh, what threatened to be the, the, the class that was going to replace the old aristoc uh, aristocracy. What they, what they called it was a meritocracy. They thought they were building a new kind of civilization. It's like, we have our wealth through merit, yeah. not through an not through inheritance. And so that was in the 1880s and 1890s. Now, fast forward 100 years, we're seeing the same thing happen all over again. Yeah. The legacy uh, financial ruling class is extremely concerned, and, and there's getting just a glimmer of it. As a matter of fact, it was only two weeks ago when Forbes published its first list of, of the wealthiest crypto uh, investors in the world. And that was an interesting list. Uh, I know many, many people on the list, and I also know that some of them were willing to cooperate, and others were terrified to be on the list. <laughs> but it's a, it's a, Kidnapping. it's a, it's a reality. Uh, it's a reality. This is this is what's what's happening. So you're going to fast forward uh, 20, 30 years, and we're going to see a different group of elites, uh, a different group of people driving forward progress. Well, that that sounds like a good thing. Um, so just a little bit aware of time. So by way of uh, drawing strings together here, Jeffrey, what do you think that there are a lot of commentators that predict uh, some severe economic upheavals, the demise of the dollar, you know, the, the crash that's been imminent for, for some years, I suppose, according to some commentators. Um, do you think that this could be or, or any kind of disruption any kind of economic crises the next one coming along you know the previous one obviously being 2008 do you think that could see these cryptocurrencies sort of change gear if you like and 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 emerge even bigger in the public mind oh no question the next financial crisis it's not going to be gold that's going to benefit it's going to be crypto it's going to be amazing i mean we should remember that bitcoin was invented precisely to mitigate against the negative consequences of things like banking and financial crises that happened sure. i mean that's that's what incentivized the creation of these systems in the Indeed. first place it so if that, if that should happen wow yeah Look out! It's it's going to be an, an amazing thing. But in the meantime, there's so many ways in which the sector is building. I'm I'm speaking to you right now from the Atlanta Bitcoin Embassy, uh, which has been open one week now, and we're you know it's it's, it's sparse for now, but we're getting uh, a bunch of ATMs shipped in. We're going to be holding um, all sorts of uh, teaching seminars and boot camps on crypto, and, and becoming a really a central place for the community to come. Uh, and learn and get to know each other and I'm hoping to see these embassies spread all over the United States and all, all, over, all over the world. Wonderful, that sounds really exciting. So would you have any closing words for the um, would-be um, 
crypto investor perhaps or, or user or w would you have any words to say to to somebody that just you know has, has a passing interest should we say how what would you say uh, then i i would say you know d don't feel bad for for missing out because there's there's a lot of gains in the future and we're, we're just at the beginning this is just an ex experiment so be courageous but be careful Okay, wonderful stuff. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeffrey, for sharing your insights there on on the whole uh, crypto ecosphere. I suppose is a good way to describe it. And um, for all you listeners out there, I do hope that you've gained some value from this episode. I hope that that you uh, will will uh, decide to look a little bit further into these cryptocurrencies. They they are extremely exciting. And uh, and I do hope you'll join me again for another episode of Living Outside the Matrix. to see.